Welcome to episode 38 of Liberty Dad Podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery. Recognizing tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, D.L., and this episode is Reviewing White Fragility. This episode is part three of my series on race-related matters. Don't worry if you didn't listen to the last two. Each episode is independent of the other. However, to get the fullest context, I definitely recommend watching them all. Back in episode 36, I discuss the experience of being experienced. For those who might prefer a discussion-style episode, check out episode 37, where instead of just me, I'm joined by my co-host, Josh Fields, from the Libertarian Apothecary, and we discuss the very same topic. Like I said, this week I'm reviewing Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility. Let's dive right in. In this episode, I'm going to review Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. One question many might ask is, why bother? And it may come with some assumptions about D'Angelo's book. I have three reasons. One, we should all be engaged in the conversation on race. Like it or not, agree or disagree, it is a major topic in America. Regardless of your specific position, most people have at least one thing in common, and that is we believe that where we are is not where we need to be in the conversation on race. Now, however, the where we are and where we need to be can differ vastly. Number two, in 1980, Isaac Asimov wrote an article titled A Cult of Ignorance. He criticizes this idea of America's right to know that's used in support of the freedom of the press. His grounds are that a right to know is useless when people don't or can't read or further behave as if educating oneself is some sort of elitist activity. He ends the article saying this, quote, I believe that every human being with a physically normal brain can learn a great deal and can be surprisingly intellectual. I believe that what we badly need is social approval of learning and social rewards for learning. We can all be members of the intellectual elite, and only then will a phrase like America's right to know, and indeed any true concept of democracy, have any meaning. End quote. In other words, being intellectual is for everyone. Number three, in episode 32, I quoted John Stuart Mill from his book On Liberty as saying this, quote, He who knows only his own side of the case knows little of it. His reasons may be good, and no one may have been able to refute them, but if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. The rational position for him would be suspension of judgment, and unless he contents himself with that, he is either led by authority or adopts, like the generality of the world, the side to which he feels most inclination. Summarizing here, Mills is saying that if you cannot refute the other side's view or you don't even know it, you don't belong having an opinion. And that if you are going to have an opinion, it will be based on some authority or whatever feels best. Mills continues saying this, quote, nor is it enough that he should hear the arguments of adversaries from his own teachers presented as they state them and accompanied by what they offer as refutations. That is not the way to do justice to the arguments or bring them into real contact with his own mind. He must be able to hear them from persons who actually believe them, who defend them in earnest and do their very utmost for them. He must know them in their most plausible and persuasive form. He must feel the force of the difficulty which the true view of the subject has to encounter and dispose of. Else, he will never really possess himself of the portion of truth which meets and removes that difficulty. End quote. 
Connecting this all together and simplifying it, we get this. Everyone should participate in the conversation on race. We all have the potential to be intellectual. And we should be, as I said back in episode 32, we should be earnest adversaries by learning about a view or idea or position directly from someone who believes it most. Some might immediately say, come on, the idea of white fragility is trash. Maybe so. But if you have not taken the time to understand the concept from D'Angelo herself, then you are not being an earnest adversary. As an aside, this attitude should actually be applied to anyone you disagree with, not just learned intellectuals. But let me step back and challenge the idea that white fragility is just trash from a different perspective. Consider that often trash to one person is value to another, and that even trash was once useful before being tossed out. That's not to support the idea of white fragility necessarily. It's just to illustrate the ambiguity in calling something trash. It doesn't move the conversation forward. Now, with my case made for reading and reviewing the book, let's get into it. D'Angelo published this book in 2018, but the term was one that she coined in her 17-page 2011 paper of the same title published in the International Journal of Critical Pedagogy. If you're watching on YouTube, I'll post the link in the show in the show notes. Those who are fully interested are encouraged to read the paper and her book. The book will be sufficient for most, but choose what you will. I found an interview with The Guardian where she briefly describes white fragility. Let's take a listen. White fragility is the defensiveness the argumentation, the hurt feelings, the withdrawal that often erupts whenever white people are challenged on their racial worldviews. The fragility part is meant to capture how little it takes to cause white people to erupt in defensiveness. But the impact of that defensiveness, however, is not fragile at all. It functions as a kind of everyday white racial control by making it so difficult for people to challenge us uh, on our unaware assumptions and biases that most of the time they don't. And so it, it functions to keep everybody in their place and protect the racial hierarchy. White fragility is the negative or untoward response from white people when challenged on their racial worldviews. Dr. D'Angelo then elaborates on this impact, telling us these responses are often minor, but they have a major impact and make having a conversation on race difficult. In a sense, I agree, but there's quite a bit to disagree with D'Angelo when you read the book and further her paper. I have three key points of disagreement with the book White Fragility, or the concept as described by Dr. D'Angelo. Number one, it's overly complex. Number two, it's disingenuous. And number three, it contributes to the cult of ignorance as described by Asimov in 1980. Let's walk through each one of these. Overly complex. In the clip we just saw, it seems like white fragility is a simple concept. That white people just have developed attitudes and behaviors that make challenging their racial worldviews, right or wrong, more difficult. But when you start digging in, you realize that white fragility suffers from what those of us from process engineering backgrounds call scope creep. What is scope creep? For those unfamiliar with the term, it's when a project expands in scope. It's when I go out to reorganize my toolboxes and then I end up reorganizing my entire workspace, then the garage, and then decide to clean out the car as well. In the introduction, D'Angelo is describing her early experience as a diversity trainer and seeing white people respond negatively. This is what she has to say, quote, I began to see what I think of as the pillars of whiteness, the unexamined beliefs that prop up our racial responses, end quote. Now that doesn't sound like much, so let's draw from her 2011 paper where she elaborates a little bit more, saying this, quote, whiteness studies begin with the premise that racism and white privilege exist in both traditional and modern forms. 
and rather than work to prove its existence, work to reveal it. This article will explore the dynamics of one aspect of whiteness and its effects, white fragility." End quote. The first counter response might be, come on DL, it makes sense to say that white fragility might just be part one aspect of a larger conversation. And you would be right if that's where it took us. But D'Angelo takes this further, much further. Here's what she says. <clears throat> quote, this book is unapologetically rooted in identity politics, end quote. And then a page later, this, quote, Throughout this book, I argue that racism is deeply complex and nuanced, and given this, we can never understand our, consider our learning to be complete or finished, end quote. A reasonable follow-up question might be, well, how complex and what kind of nuance? D'Angelo gives us that too. This part is a bit lengthy, but here's what she has to say. Quote, a significant aspect of the white script derives from our seeing ourselves as both objective and unique. To understand white fragility, we have to begin to understand why we cannot fully be either. We must understand the forces of socialization. End quote. Then continuing on a few lines later, she says this. Quote, but exploring these cultural frameworks can be particularly challenging in a Western culture precisely because of two key Western ideologies, individualism and objectivity, end quote. The scope here now includes Western culture and the ideologies of individualism and objectivity. Were you expecting that? Were you expecting the idea that white people may be res responding poorly to being challenged on their racial worldviews to get to that point? Well, it goes even further. D'Angelo tells us that individualism, quote, claims that there are no intrinsic barriers to individual success and that failure is not a consequence of social structures but comes from individual character. According to the ideology of individualism, race is irrelevant, end quote. I disagree, but let's save that for the next point. You might be enticed to say, well, DL, maybe racism has deeper roots than you think. To see how deep D'Angelo thinks these roots go, let's consult again her 2011 paper, where she says this, quote, the disavowal of race as an organizing factor both of individual white consciousness and the institutions of society at large is necessary to support current structures of capitalism and domination. For without it, the correlation between the distribution of social resources and unearned white privilege would be evident. The existence of structural inequality undermines the claim that privilege is simply a reflection of hard work and virtue. Therefore, Inequality must be hidden or justified as resulting from lack of effort. Individualism accomplishes both of these tasks. End quote. Ooh, that's quite a mouthful. Let's simplify that. White fragility prevents us from recognizing white privilege, and the correlation between white privilege and the distribution of social resources would be more obvious, but for capitalism and domination, which are supported by individualism and objectivity. What is often presented as responses that interfere with improving race relations sounds a lot more like something else. But there's plenty to disagree with without labels and modern day McCarthyist claims. Let's talk about why the book and the idea of white fragility is disingenuous. Moving on to my next point. It's disingenuous to present the notion that white fragility when recognized and addressed, can help improve racial relations when it's strongly correlated with the distribution of resources. Call it an ivory tower bait and switch. But even some of the assumptions stated in the book and D'Angelo's foundational paper are disingenuous as well. I'd go further and say they're kind of out of touch with reality. Let's take a look at a few. Quote, individualism claims that there are no intrinsic barriers to individual success, end quote. 
The view of individualism is probably where I disagree with D'Angelo the most. I consider myself an observationalist, drawing conclusions from a variety of observations. Contrary to her claim that individualism claims there are no intrinsic barriers to individual success, I observe that society celebrates individualism precisely because of those intrinsic barriers. In last year's Midweek Moments, when this podcast was audio only, I discussed several black individuals during Black History Month who I thought many people might not be familiar with. Uh, let me give you their names. One, Lieutenant Commander Wendell Brown. He was the first African-American graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy. Number two, U.S. Marshal Bass, the first African-American U.S. Marshal. And then third, Bessie Coleman, the first African-American Native American and woman to get her aviation license and perform as a stunt flyer in the United States. Each of these has an amazing story where they overcame the barrier of racism in their time to accomplish something that now inspires us. And upon her death when attempting an aerial stunt, this was said of Bessie Coleman by Lieutenant William J. Powell, a fellow African American aviator. Quote, because of Bessie Coleman, we have overcome that which was worse than racial barriers. We have overcome the barriers within ourselves and dared to dream, end quote. And this isn't extended to our fellow Americans who are black or other people of color. People like Helen Keller come to mind for overcoming being deaf and blind, as well as Theodore Roosevelt for overcoming early asthma and poor health. It's not limited to Americans either with the likes of Anne Frank, Marie Curie, Beethoven, and others, all who inspire us today by their individualism and stories of, face, of facing adversity. No, individualism is celebrated because of intrinsic, intrinsic barriers. Consider this point that D'Angelo makes, quote, the story of Jackie Robinson is a classic example of how whiteness obscures racism. She goes on and says, Robinson is often celebrated as the first African-American to break the color line and play in Major League Baseball. While Robinson was certainly an amazing baseball player, this storyline depicts him as racially special, a black man who broke the color line himself. The subtext is that Robinson finally had what it took to play with whites, as if no black athlete before him was strong enough to compete at that level." End quote. This is neither my experience nor my observation, but even more importantly, it's a wild deviation from the actual series of events. In 1945, Branch Rickey, the man who hired Robinson to play for the Dodgers, held tryouts for a fictitious team called the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers. What he was really up to was looking for a player who had the skill and temperament to break the color line. It was Robinson, Robinson's athletic skill and the quality of his character that gave him the opportunity. There wasn't any subtext about Robinson being a black man who just finally had what it took. Not during the time, at least for those in the know, and not today, now that we have the details. D'Angelo is quite simply factually incorrect. But even how D'Angelo describes terms is a bit disingenuous. In countering the idea that she might just be subtly calling people immoral or racist, she says this about racism, quote, In the post-civil rights era, we have been taught that racists are mean people who intentionally dislike others because of their race, end quote. Again, as an observationalist, that isn't my experience or how I've seen others define racism. Th there isn't a consistent definition but it roughly seems defined as a view that certain races are naturally inferior or superior in some way based on race. This is observed in conversations about IQ, athletic skill, various group behaviors, and other such things. These arguments often suggest that things like blacks are better, naturally better at basketball, football, foot races, white men cannot jump, Asians are good at math, Jews are great bankers, and on and on with the absurd correlations between race or ethnicity and a given activity. To be clear, such assumptions are incorrect, 
and racist if we define it as thinking certain races naturally have some inferior or superior skill or ability. And that is my point. While D'Angelo says we are taught to define racism as just mean people who intentionally dislike others because of race, our day-to-day -day conversations tell an entirely different story. Individualism, Robinson, and defining racism are just three small points where I believe that D'Angelo's book presents disingenuously. American culture does not and has never celebrated individualism as she describes it. Robinson is not seen as a black man that finally had what it took to play at the level of whites. And while many conversations about race need a lot of work, they still don't fit the narrative of what she claims people think it means to be racist. Let's look at my last point, cult of ignorance. Isaac Asimov wrote about the too frequent attitude of disdain that Americans had toward being intellectual and educated. But he also expressed belief that being intellectual was within reach of most. When we take an idea and make it overly complex and then fill it with mistruth or inaccurate assertions, it becomes further from the reach of everyday people. It contributes to the cult of ignorance because it requires more and more for people to untangle, especially if it feels more complex than it should be. Back in episode 34, I walked through just an 11 minute portion of Dr. King Jr.'s The Other America speech. That 11 minutes was part of a fuller 45 minute speech. And in just 11 minutes and a little bit of research to familiarize myself with events that King was speaking about that occurred prior to 1967, I gained a tremendous amount of insight. In that 11 minutes, he defined racism in about two sentences. He told me what racism was and also what it wasn't. He provided insight why the black community was frustrated and angry. The constant actions that were taken to improve the lives of black Americans that were followed by other actions that reversed them. He also condemned actions by black people and those by white people. And that is the riots and the events that gave rise to riots. And then finally, he told me where exactly the disconnect between the worldview of whites and blacks in America differed, his thoughts on the so-called white backlash. He affirmed some things to white Americans and he challenged others. White Fragility, the book, the original paper, and the concept, so far as I've read, does none of that. Instead, it describes an attitude deeply entrenched in the very being of people based on their skin color affirmed by virtually any response given. Does that sound familiar? Considering King's The Other America speech, he describes racism as, quote, the theory that another group or another race is totally depraved, innately impure, and innately inferior, end quote. Now, to be fair, D'Angelo doesn't take it this far, but she does ride the edge. I want you to watch this next clip from that Guardian interview. The number one question I'm asked is, what do we do? And before I answer that, I want to offer a couple of challenges to that question because I find it a very problematic question. So the first thing is to think long and deep about what it took for you to ask that question. How in 2020, your question could be, what do I do about racism? How you have managed not to know and write down how you have managed to be a full functioning adult in 2020 and not know what to do about racism. And everything you write down will be your map and nothing you write down will be easy to address, but everything on it can be addressed and then get to work. Consider D'Angelo's response. Keep in mind that she writes this about her own experience. Quote, it took me several years to see beneath these reactions. At first, I was intimidated by them, and they held me back and kept me careful and quiet. But over time, I began to see what lay beneath this anger and resistance to discuss race or listen to people of color, end quote. Working as a diversity trainer, she admits she was unable to identify the cause of behaviors she observed, saying, quote, 
I came to see that the way we are taught to define racism makes it virtually impossible for white people to understand it, end quote. It's another disingenuous position because she tells people in the moment the way it's taught is almost impossible for white people to understand, but then turns around and blithely and condescendingly asks you to consider how is it in 2020 you have become a functioning adult who doesn't know what to do about racism. How could you not with this kind of definition? Quote, or to, to D'Angelo, I would ask this, which is it? Is racism taught that it's virtually impossible for white people to understand? Or should they be embarrassed that in 2020, now 2021, they might be a fully functional adult who doesn't know what to do about it? Finally, I would like to compare her words against that of two individuals mentioned in this episode. This is the most complicated uh, social dilemma of the last several hundred years. We need many angles, many approaches, and many voices. According to Dr. D'Angelo, this is the most complicated social dilemma of the last several hundred years. Recall the words of William J. Powell earlier, quote, because of Bessie Coleman, we have overcome that which was worse than racial barriers. We have overcome the barriers within ourselves and dared to dream, end quote. And now I want you to consider this 1972 clip of Jackie Robinson while he was on the Dick Cavett show. This was at, well after him breaking the color line and many years after his own work in civil rights activism. Dick is asking him about, he's asking about Jackie's son who had died in a car accident, but not before overcoming drug addiction. Here's part of Jackie's response. And if this country is to survive, we've got to deal with that drug program because it's pretty obvious, at least as far as I'm concerned, that every youngster in this country, in one way or the other, unless we do something about this problem, is going to come into contact with marijuana or heroin or some kind of drug in some kind of way. And unless we change our priorities, unless we put a great deal of emphasis on helping our young people, I just can't see the drug pro pro problem diminishing in the way that it should. And, and it is, to me, the worst problem that we have in this country today, mm -hmm. even worse than the race problem. Not all black Americans will feel the same. Some will say race issues are still the biggest problem America faces today. Nevertheless, I believe there is an argument to be made that much of the conversation today about race issues is less about race and more about something else. I hope you enjoyed this episode. In next week's episode, I'll touch on D'Angelo's approach to the issue of racism and offer some of my own thoughts. But for now, I think it's time for a bill review. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Hi, welcome back. I have a guest in studio again. The goal of the Bill Review is to promote the idea that everyday Americans can and should take the time to read any legislation, order, or mandate. Since I'm not a lawyer, this isn't a legal interpretation, and I may be wrong. Bills range from a page or two to thousands of pages long. And since they can be rather dry, this segment is short and only meant to show you just how much you can learn in only a few minutes. Continuing with the theme of Black History Month, I'm focusing on bills related to the black community. Today, I review H.R. 40, Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act. This legislation was introduced in the House on January 3rd, 2019 by C Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas, and it currently has 173 co-sponsors, all Democrats, and it's 14 pages long. In Section 2, Part B, this bill defines its purpose, saying, quote, The purpose of this act is to establish a commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans, end quote. There's something interesting that I'd like to note about this bill, and that is much of it is dedicated to reviewing history and making proclamations. For instance, in Section 3, Part B1, it outlines the duties of the commission this bill establishes. Here's what it says. 
Quote, identify, compile, and synthesize the relevant corpus of evidentiary documents, documentation of the institution of slavery which existed within the United States and the colonies that became the United States from 1619 through 1865. Then in part, due, part B2, it says this, the role which the federal government and state governments of the United States supported the institution of slavery is in constitutional and statutory provisions, including the extent which government prevented a po pardon me, including the extent to which governments prevented, opposed, or restricted efforts of formerly enslaved Africans and their descendants to repatriate to their homeland, end quote. Here is the very interesting part about that. Like the two executive orders signed by President Biden that I reviewed in previous episodes, this piece of legislation doesn't itself offer anything of substance. Keep in mind, the very first line of this it says a bill, quote, to address the fundamental injustice, cruelty, brutality, and humanity of slavery, inhumanity of slavery in the United States and the 13 colonies between 1619 and 1865, and to establish a commission to study and consider a national apology and proposal for reparations for the institution of slavery, end quote. A national apology and reparations may sound like a wonderful idea to many. And who would oppose addressing fundamental injustice, cruelty, brutality, and inhumanity? The problem with this bill is that it doesn't guarantee any of that. The only guarantees are that a commission would be formed to review this information. Furthermore, this bill, it authorizes the appropriation of $12 million intended to study and produce a report one year after the members have their first meeting. What I find most interesting is that under Section 2, titled Findings and Purpose, this bill makes some declarations. Here are some of the things that it finds. Number one, four million Africans and their descendants were enslaved in the U.S. and its colonies between 1619 and 1865. Between 1789 and 1865, the Constitution and various laws permitted slavery in the U.S. Number three, slavery deprived Africans life, liberty, citizenship rights from their own countries, cultural heritage, and denied them the fruit of their labor. And number four, an overwhelming amount of documentation exists proving the effects of slavery linger on today. It then goes on to list a few more items, all of which are widely known and primarily mostly accepted, with one exception being the degree of impact of slavery that exists today. Reparations are not a guarantee. A national apology is not a guarantee. Nor is there any guarantee regarding any change in current law. The only thing that is explicitly guaranteed in this bill, should it pass, is that a group of people will be formed to spend $12 million to look into it and make some recommendations. If you think this is still a good step because it may lead to something, you may wish to start reviewing more legislation and the follow-up and what comes of the government spending. At the beginning of this bill, I, or this bill review, I pointed out that this bill has 173 co-sponsors. Compare that against Senate Bill 3955, introduced by Senator Rand Paul back in June of last year. That bill, known as the Justice for Breonna Taylor Act, would ban no-knock raids at the federal and state level. Eight months later, it still has the same two Republican co-sponsors and not a single Democrat. No studies, no maybe reparations, and no hopeful national apology. Signed today, and no more no-knock raids tomorrow. And by the way, do we really believe the President of the United States really needs to spend $12 million before he issues a national apology? If he really wanted to do it, he would have. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head over to trovo.live forward slash free speech media where the weekly episode of Just Me 
airs Monday night at 10 p.m. Or join Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary and me on Friday night at 11 p.m. for a discussion-style episode of the same topic. And while you're there, be sure to check out other free speech media shows. And remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And we are going to be out because somebody has found a toy.